I'm Karen Kinzel, the director of the Palo Alto Art Center, and I'm delighted to see you all here for the second in our three event series focused on Black art history with Dr. Bridget R. Cooks. A reminder that our final event in the series will be on Friday, August 13th, same time, and I hope you will join us. This series of programs is offered in conjunction with the exhibition, The Black Index. I hope that you've all had a chance to see the exhibition, which is on view through August 14th. Um, I would also like to promote an exciting free virtual conversation happening next Friday uh, at noon, uh, that's Friday the 16th, a conversation with Dr. Cooks, internationally recognized artist Titus Gafar, whose work is included in the Black Index, and San Jose acclaimed artist Diana Pumpley Bates. And this conversation is co-sponsored by MOAD in San Francisco. It promises to be a really wonderful program and I encourage you all to attend. I would like to briefly thank the numerous supporters who made this exhibition possible. They are all listed in the slide. And I'd also like to thank the members and supporters of the Art Center who makes programs and exhibitions like this possible. Become a member of the Art Center by following this link, uh, support the Art Center and receive wonderful benefits in the process. I'm now delighted to introduce the curator of the Black Index exhibition, Dr. Bridget R. Cooks, who will lead today's program. Bridget fills a joint appointment in the Department of African American Studies and the Department of Art History at the University of California, Irvine. She is a respected educator, scholar, and curator, and we are so honored to have her share her knowledge and insights with all of us this evening. Thank you. All right, thank you um, to Karen for the introduction and the women behind the scenes, um, Karen Kwan and um, Paige Sweeten for all the work that they do. It's an amazing team um, who get everything done, including the donors that Karen has already thanked. And I wanna share my appreciation again for allowing the Black Index to come um, to the Palo Alto Art Center. So I am going to share my screen and um, just give me one second to do that. Here we go. Okay, and we'll start here with Jacob Lawrence. So I hope that everyone's had a chance to see uh, the exhibition. We're so delighted to have the exhibition open in person. It opened initially at UC Irvine and, and we weren't able to have very many people um, come to see the show. So it's really wonderful to finally have it accessible to everyone. And I'm really honored that you're here on a Friday evening um, to learn something more about the history of, of African-American artists. So this is places and there were so many things um, so many artists and, and objects um, that I could put in. So um, I am going to pace myself. I think we'll get through three different artists, but you know there are dozens and dozens um, to choose from. And I'm happy, of course, to share a list or other resources for people who are interested in learning more. So I wanted to start with Jacob Lawrence. He was the first person that came to mind when we were talking about the idea of place. And um, he is such an important person in African American art history. I mean, truly a pioneer in um, the style in which he worked, the content of his work, and also um, his exhibition history. Um, he is the second uh, Black artist to have a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, MoMA in New York. And um, it was a series of works uh, called The Migration of the Negro um, from uh, 1940 to 1941. And we're gonna take a look at some of these. Um, this is an installation shot of the show when it was at MoMA in 1944. Um, but it took him two years to make this work. This is work he made while he was serving as a seaman in the US Coast Guard. Um, and it's a single work of art made up of 60 different panels. And we'll just look at um, a handful of them here. Um, in terms of exhibition history, I mean, this, is, uh, this work is so interesting to me. Um, it was very popular when it was first exhibited. Um, 
at the Phillips Memorial at Gallery, which is now the Phillips Collection in Washington, DC. And uh, both the Phillips and MoMA fought over the purchase of this collection. And so they split it in a very awkward split. MoMA bought the even numbers um, and the Phillips bought the odd numbers. And once every 15 or 20 years, uh, one or the other museum will bring all of the works together um, so that you can see all 60 panels together. Um, what he was focusing on is exactly uh, what's described in the title of the migration of the Negro or the great migration. And they're small tempera um, paintings. They're very matte um, and, and small. Um, and you see a signature style that Jacob Lawrence is known for. Um, I would say, you know, if, if many Americans could name an African-American artist, Jacob Lawrence would probably be in the, the top three of uh, more famous artists. Um, and he was well known at this, at this time um, for really emerging, but breaking through uh, racial barriers in the museum world. What you see in the signature style is very simple, representations of, of African-American people. Um, the signature style that we can think of as kind of blocks of color, um, no use of shading or modeling to represent facial features, um, that there's something simple about it, not simplistic, but simple about it. it. Makes it very accessible and easy to read so that even if you we're not able to, um, to read the text that goes along with each panel, you would have an idea of the story that's being told. So uh, this is panel number one. During the World War, there was a great migration north by Southern Negroes. And you can see the, the destinations uh, uh, at the train station, uh, the clothing that people are wearing. Um, you can see some of the luggage that they're carrying and um, a whole assortment of hats. Um, so there, it's, it is very accessible work, um, which was something that was really important to, um, to Jacob Lawrence to be able to communicate this history of Black Americans to um, a wide group of people. Um, this is panel 15 and I'll read this caption. Another cause was lynching right, cause for the great migration, it was found that where there had been lynching, the people who were reluctant to leave at first left immediately after this. And um, I just want to spend some time on this image. And um, this is, for me, one of the most um, uh, difficult and, uh, and powerful images in the whole series. Um, one of the reasons why is that um, if we just look at the language and the tone um, that Jacob Lawrence used, we can um, understand a, a number of tensions um, in what's being presented with this work. When we, we think about the history of lynching, the violence of lynching, right? The prevalence of lynching, there's something very generous and deliberate about the language here. So if we go to that uh, second sentence, it was found that where there had been lynching, right? This is such a passive way to tell this story. Um, Lawrence could have gone to any number of, of black people in the South and the North and anywhere along the way and met many people who could just say, I saw my father lynched, right? Um, that, that that voice could have been the voice to tell the story, but it's not the voice that tells this story. So there's something really strategic about the way that um, Lawrence chooses to tell this story that um, for me makes it very powerful because when I read that, I read strategy and I read restraint. Um, I think um, another thing we can think about is in terms of restraint, right? There's no one here to blame. It was found, right? It doesn't say 
that, that it's anyone's fault, right? So we, we get this sense of, of real distancing that makes the story of black people, uh, specifically through the great migration, very palatable to, um, to white viewers. And that's of course, who was going to MoMA in the 1940s. Um, I'm going to ask uh, for people to be generous enough to um, to help us get through looking at some of this work and sharing some of these ideas. If if anyone would would like to um, say something about the image that goes along with the text, I think we could all benefit from that. Anything very simple of just what we're looking at here, and maybe how it relates to the text about lynching. And you can just unmute yourself and go ahead. For me, the, the, the noose is horrifying, but yeah. the, the abyss between the person and the noose is that's like, that's haunting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Marcia. Yeah, just using that word abyss, you know, that's not a word that we use every day. There's something dramatic about it. Um, there's something um, extreme about it. Um, and that, you know, this is the thing, this work, it seems so simple and you can just walk along from panel to panel and keep it moving, right? But when you really stop to see the decisions that he's making, um, it's very sparse. There's a lot of, emptiness. Um, and we can think about that maybe emotionally in relationship to grief. Um, the horror of the noose. Um, does anyone want to add to this description? Yeah, I was struck by um, how much emotion is conveyed by that one figure. There's just a few lines there, but Boy, is there a lot of emotion in just a few lines. Yeah. And, you know, it's the shape. It's very powerful. It is. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. Yeah. It's like a lump of a person. It's just like a, a shape and the suggestion of a head and that line of the sort of weight of the shoulder that's dipped down um, and goes around the crook of the arm, the elbow there into the back. Um, you know, you think about how this person maybe looks deformed by grief, you know, and what that, that feels like the gesture, if you curl yourself up like that, right, the emotion that, um, that comes with that fetal position. Um, and because we don't have a face, it could be very easy to imagine that that's you, perhaps, you know, specifically as a black viewer, there might be a way in which in the 1940s, especially black viewers could see this work and really identify, right? Imagine that, that it was them. And for people who are not black to look at the gesture there, the simplicity of it, but there's a clarity in the emotion that's being um, expressed. Yeah, any other thoughts about this? this work. Um, I'll just say, um, I'm always kind of fascinated by this branch. This branch looks like a, an elongated arm and hand and maybe that little uh, part here could be a thumb, right? This is just my imagination. I'm not saying this is what he wanted us to see or what he was thinking, but there's some kind of emotion in imagining a kind of extension, right? And a kind of vulnerability of that body out there hanging. Um, there, it, there's no comfort here. Um, so there is something, you know, quite profound and brilliant. I, I think in some ways, Jacob Lawrence certainly is a well-known black artist, but I'm, I think that at the same time, he's underappreciated. Um, and it's nice to have the opportunity to, to sit and spend some more time. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna show you two more on this screen. Uh, panel 24, child labor and a lack of education was one of the other reasons for people wishing to leave their homes. 
Um, does anyone want to start with maybe a mood that you're getting from this work or, or um, the feeling that you get from maybe specifically the figures and the way that they're posed? Well, you definitely get a, a feeling that um, there's a lot of weight, a lot of heavy heaviness to the mm -hmm. to the scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it looks like we we can't tell exactly what they're carrying, but I would, I it could be grain, it could be cotton, it could be wheat, um, but something very heavy. And um, yeah, the it's hot thinking about the lack of clothing and the kind of um, really expressive movements with the sway of the back, right? Backwards and then forwards, um, and then all the way over with the figure in the middle and um, the way that they're working together to move this uh, product or raw materials from one place to another. And all right. of the heads, all of the heads are down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Yeah, they're all down. The heads are all down. Yeah, I mean, it, it has a psychological impact on us, I think, um, as we're seeing. Yes, everyone's uh, names have disappeared. There's a gentleman who has his hand up with the white shirt with the black stripe across. Do you want to go ahead? Perhaps that's me. I don't know if you could. Ken, see me. now, yes, Sorry. your name just popped up. Ken, Sorry. please go ahead. So I was going to comment that I find the checkerboard in these sort of pastel colors is being sort of uh, shocking. Just the, it's such a different uh, feeling compared mm -hmm. to the rest of this image. And that uh, I'm not sure exactly how to think of it, but it, it's just jarring to me. Okay. Yeah, so that's helpful, Ken, to think about a contrast between the heads down and the body distorted, right? And then this kind of brightness of um, the checkerboard of the, the bright blue and the yellow. And, you know, maybe he was trying to make the work more palatable, you know, so it's not all depressing, but that there's some life or energy. I mean, it could be a strategy to get people to not feel bad. If I can guess, I wonder if it was to suggest that the people working here were disassociated from the product of their labor. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's helpful to think about. Mm. They're not going to really benefit from whatever is being made luxury goods, clothing, what have you, um, that there's a, a distance, yeah, between the product and the labor. You know, especially when you consider that they're children, you're really struck by the lack of um, expression and, you know, that, that you associate with children. Mm -hmm. They're clearly, um, they've got, they're totally oppressed in, in their aspect. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And when you think about children, you want to think about play mm -hmm. and fun. Um, yeah. Between the four of them, I just see one eye. Yes. Um, yeah. So there's something very unnatural going on um, with, the, with the way that children are treated here. Do these figures look to you like Egyptian paintings? You know, I see the little skirts they have on and the yeah the the uh, silhouettes the figures are in the same way and I don't know if that is a his a deliberate link to Egyptian art or not mm -hmm. looks that way to me that is really interesting I think you're right on with that um it does make you think of slave labor in the ancient world and building the pyramids. I don't, I don't see how this could not be a deliberate reference. And I'd have to think more, maybe all of us would have to think more about what 
what is the reference, the meaning of the reference to think about these kids as slave labor and to maybe associate it with um, I don't know, the building of a royal temple or um, I don't know, something, uh, some labor that's being done for some greater good. I'm not sure, but I, I definitely see what you're seeing. I mean, these are not the clothes that we see when we look at engravings and photographs of enslaved African-Americans. There's something more sort of classical um, and ancient in the way that they're being presented. And, and maybe again, that might be going towards palatability, right? Making this seem um, more picturesque than it actually was. And then someone else, and I'm sorry, your name isn't popping up on my screen, but you have your hand up. Um, yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah, it was I, and my hand was up to say just what you said. Oh, okay. Uh, when I first saw it, I thought it was Egyptian, and the reference, of course, is the slave labor mm -hmm. that built the pyramids, and you know, um, back to um, pre-biblical times. Mm -hmm. It's lasted since then. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think it's really interesting that maybe there is a, um, a way in which if people are familiar or more comfortable thinking about slave labor and ancient Egypt, that maybe they might have some more pity or empathy, um, thinking about it in a more recent context. Any of those things that too. might be possible. Yeah, Helen, were you saying something? I was saying that too, but I, I, I can't find where to weigh how to do the hand raise. <laughs> oh, okay, that's okay. Yeah, we're informal enough, which, whichever way yeah. it works. Well, somebody showed me how to do it in another Zoom thing and I can't find it this way, in this one. <laughs> Is it at the bottom of your screen? Does it give you an option down there if, if you make your window big enough? Yeah, well, I it's, it's big, but for some reason, I, I mean, I open it and I see where other people put their hands up, but, I, but when I try to go to more, it just says rename. It doesn't say yeah. um, any other options. Well, um, it's under reactions, which is to the, usually to the far right of the- Oh, oh way over here? Yeah. Oh, there, oh, Yay. okay, okay, Yay. great, Thanks, okay, Starcha. now I see it. <laughs> Somebody, as I said, somebody pointed it out to me for something I did last week or whatever, and I already forgot. <laughs> okay, no problem. And I Definitely. can't help because as host, I don't have those options on my screen anymore. So thanks, Marcia. Thank you. Um, this is the last panel I'm, I'm showing. And again, there are 60 of them. Okay, so we've only looked at three. This is the fourth one. Uh, in the North, the Negro had better educational facilities. Um, I mean, I like this sort of in a, you know, expected way because they're girls, you know, they're girls who are being educated. And I identify with that. And I love that. I remember seeing this at a much younger age and thinking, look, there's girls in school um, and how cool that was. Um, there's also those gestures that they have, right? That they're reaching way above them. Um, it's like they're competing to get the highest number. And I feel like there's some energy and excitement about learning um, uh, with this group of girls, maybe they're friends. And, um, and then you can think metaphorically about higher expectations and better improved facilities and having that connect to correspond in some way with that gesture of reaching higher. Uh, primary colors, right? Red, yellow, and blue. Primary education. All of that sort of comes into an overall effect of this work. And what was the year, uh, Bridget? Yeah, these were made from 41 to, sorry, 40 to 41, 1940 uh -huh. to 1941. Because I'm reminded of the Black athletes at the um, Olympics down in LA, raising their hand on the platform. Oh, yeah. that was in Mexico City in the 70s. 68. Right. Was, it was it 68? 68? Okay, thank you. Mexico 68. Yeah. Um, I, I used to live near San Jose State, and there was a statue near the tower of, of John, John Carlos and Tommy mm -hmm. 
smooth. <laughs> yeah, it's an international story and yeah, very local Northern California South Bay story too, which is very cool. Um, I want to, let's see, I'm putting something in the chat. If people are interested, you can look at this on your own later. I'm gonna um, show you a little bit of it now. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, I just wanted to point you to, I think I have to stop. Let me see. Ah. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing and reshare my screen because I need to show you um, another window so just bear with me please uh let's see what i can do here Stop. yes okay so this is uh where the link will tell you and so if you're interested you can save that and um you know look at this on your own later because there's a lot here more than i have time to go through now but um the museum of modern art had all 60 panels uh, in 2015 and had an exhibition called One Way Ticket. And so I just wanted you to know that you can look at this um, to see the entire series um, with all of the original text. Okay, so you can go through there. There's a history about each one and commentary on each one. Um, so you're welcome to do that. It's a great interactive resource. Um, perspectives by uh, different uh, people today on Jacob Lawrence and the Great Migration um, from, you know, really fancy people like Elizabeth Alexander, um, people who are, are coming from different fields. That's here. And um, information on Harlem walking tour, more about the Great Migration, all of that's here for you. So just wanted to give you that resource and I'll, I'll switch back. Um, I also want to show you, yes, this one picture that I kind of snuck in here. So this is Jacob Lawrence in his Coast Guard uniform um, at the opening. He was um, stationed officially by the US government to appear at his opening at MoMA in 1944. And, um, and it's very interesting. All of the images of Jacob Lawrence at this time with the work uh, show him as a true patriot telling an American story. And um, I wanted to read something that MoMA wrote in their museum bulletin about the work when they showed it. So it says, in spite of the stark simplification of forms and bold contrasts of primary colors that give so much strength to the work, his pictorial statements are quiet, even tempered, non inflammatory. His pictures do not mount a soapbox or preach a sermon. Yet, almost imperceptibly, um, his Coast Guard paintings suggest the gradual beginnings of a solution to the problem so movingly portrayed in the migration series. So it's, a, it's I'm really always interested in my research on museum exhibitions and, and how work was received by critics and the audiences at the time. And I just wanted to read this, I mean, because I'm fascinated by it, but also to take us back to that, um, the strategy that I was talking about with the text, the way that he tells the story, it's, it's really appreciated in 1944, right? That the, the work is non-inflammatory. How do you make lynching non-inflammatory like that? <laughs> You know, what were the conditions that he as this pioneering black artist was working in where he had to make lynching uh, non-inflammatory and, and then the white museum establishment like MoMA really championed him for that, you know? So um, I just wanted to, to say all of that just to help us understand a bit more uh, what the art world was like and at this time for Jacob Lawrence and what people appreciated about the work. Now, I'm leading up to something though. I wanna introduce um, Azavaria Simmons, uh, who's a contemporary artist and um, show you this work called The Whole United States is Southern from 2019. This is a work that I saw in a show called Soft Power that you may have seen also at SF MoMA in 2020 just before uh, the pandemic shut down. 
And this work is an homage, a direct homage to uh, Jacob Lawrence's The Migration of the Negro that we were just talking about. So here she uses uh, colors from his palette and she uses some of his text, but then she also uses her own. And she's also completely removed the figure, right? There's also, I think, and this is just subjective, a, a kind of less gentle approach um, in the way that she is uh, delivering uh, the, the facts and the storytelling versus the way that Lawrence relays the facts um, in the storytelling. So this first square up here, she says something very direct that we don't find in Lawrence's work. The history of racism and exclusion in the United States is the history of whiteness. California once tried to ban free black people. Um, and then she goes on, right? Uh, the trains were packed continually with migrants. That's something that Jacob Lawrence says. Um, the Negro who had been part of the soil for many years was now going into and living new life in the urban centers. Um, there's a, a different way that she's creating pictures. And uh, you can see how large this work is. I mean, to stand up next to it, you come up maybe four squares high and you're really, um, uh, what's the word, uh, dwarfed, right? Made to feel very small in relationship to a kind of direct way in which she's telling this story. And I like to look at this work with Jacob Lawrence's series because it shows a different generation, a different time period, but still a relevance of, uh, of African-American history in a, uh, you know, in a very different kind of visual approach. These are just my pictures, so they're not terrific. Any thoughts you have about, um, I mean, this is almost conceptual art, but any thoughts you have about this presentation, I'll go back to, it, and maybe it's relationship to the original work by Lawrence. What do you think about, uh, what do you think about the, the writing, you know, the font? If, style. If, I, if I could say, I find this piece, and it's hard to look at it on a computer screen, of course. I know. But I, I find this piece uh, less accessible in that the Lawrence uh, installation, everything was sort of uh, four feet off the floor where most people would be seeing it near their eye level. Mm -hmm. Where this is, it's supposed to represent the entire history of the country. So it should be overwhelming, but it's hard to grasp this mm -hmm. yeah yeah i i see that for sure it is it is overwhelming and uh it's hard to read all of it i remember moving around quite a bit before i decided where i would take the picture because i couldn't get it all you know uh in one shot the way i wanted to so yeah there's something um there's something also about the text that you don't know if you're supposed to read it across or if you're supposed to read it down. I mean, it's uh, a bit more chaotic and certainly not as ordered and I agree, accessible. Um, there seems to be a lot more tension in this work than uh, in Lawrence's work. Some parts of it looks like writing on a blackboard. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, these are such simple decisions that artists are making that I think can have really profound uh, impacts. So we think about teaching and basic education and what do we learn about American history um, and maybe how she's trying to make that part of that um, primary education like we saw um, in panel 58. So a lot, a lot to think about here. I would like to see this um, up at MoMA or the Phillips Collection when they show um, Jacob Lawrence's work. Just because I think it's, in terms of art experience, it would be interesting to see both, not in the exact same gallery, but at least in the same conversation, the same um, space. Other thoughts about this before we move on? I, I really enjoy the kind of con confrontation of it because it's 
Like you're not getting it from subtle, yeah. meaning white people, you're not getting it from, from subtle images. Mm -hmm. Well, not so subtle images, some of them, but this, you know, and here it is in the written word. We're trying to appeal to, or trying to have you understand it from your mm -hmm. thinking, mm -hmm. from consciousness. Yeah, it's a, it is a different approach. I agree. I think you and Ken are sharing some of the same feelings that um, it is confrontational. It's, it's overwhelming. Um, it has just a different feeling where uh, Zavera seems uh, much less concerned about how you feel about this, this history. Whereas Lawrence um, very painfully cares um, that no one feels bad. Right, and in his, again, like even just going back to panel 15 with the lynching, I, most people, I've watched them, they walk right by. And that's how, you know, most people are in museums and sometimes we are too. Um, you just walk right by, you see it, there's a, a figure move on, moving on. But if you can really stop and spend time, it's, it is, it can be equally as confrontational as this. So there's, it, I'm interested in, in the artists using different strategies get, to kind of get to the same place. It's, it's kind of a fascinating pairing um, that I wanted to share just for, for your information. And some of you may have seen this already since it was in San Francisco. Okay, wow, the time really flies. Um, I'll move quickly on this. This is one of my favorite paintings. Um, it's it's uh, also by uh, Zveria um, and it's just called Velvet. Um, and I'll show you another, I, I have the text and I'll read the text to you so you, know, you don't have to strain for that. Um, but this is just, uh, this is a different set of works, um, but this was shown in, there's these galleries that face the, the street in New York at MoMA and these are just people on the street walking past. Um, who are reading this painting. So it's description, um, we can say it's poetry, we can say it's writing on the blackboard, right? It's educational. What I like about this work, there, to me, there's something really bold about this and saying, since you know the theme of today's class is places, this is landscape, right? There's something really bold and arrogant about that. Um, and then when you actually read the text, and I'll, I'll read some of it just for the sake of time, I won't read all of it. Here the waves are a deep velvet. They are soft black and fragrant like dew mixed with a thick resinous wood and local honey. This photograph is an image of two mountains set against a black background. It is also an image of the sea located between these two mountains. In this darkness is the sea and at dawn also. Um, what I like about it is that each of us create in our minds a different landscape. Um, so in some ways, yeah, it's poetry. Like you do this when you read a poem in a book, but it hasn't been done before um, in painting and it's unexpected in that way. And it's large. Um, so it has a different kind of presence um, than reading a book and it's more public. So. It's a, you know, it's a conceptual piece. It's kind of a simple idea that I think uh, is powerful. Mm. So I just wanted to show that to you. Helen, go ahead. Were you gonna say something? No. no. Sorry. That's okay. Does anyone wanna to add to this? We can move on. Um, I'm looking at the time and I think I'm going to skip over a few things because I really want to uh, make sure we talk about Dawood Bay and um, these images um, are also by Zaveria Simmons and I'd like to get uh, to at least one other artist. Um, but quickly, uh, these images are her attempt in um, sort of claiming the American landscape um, and all of its variations for African-American people. And these all look like, to me, sort of prompts for short stories. They're all very unexpected to me. There's something familiar and unfamiliar about them. Um, and she's interested in questions of who do we, do we expect to see certain kinds of people in certain landscapes? 
who do, who do landscapes belong to? Um, and, um, you know, what are ex our expectations of uh, the kind of people we see in different places? So she's interested in um, uh, Bierstadt um, and Thomas Cole. Um, she's interested in the Hudson uh, Valley painters and remaking this work through photography. High season brown. What's going on here? It's unclear. We had more time. Um, I know that you would have lots to say about this. Uh, a, a kind of Ansel Adams type uh, black woman photographer here in Canyon. And this is Zaveria. I'm um, thinking about uh, the kinds of landscapes that may have um, uh, inspired her to make this work. And then I wanted to show in the same kind of landscape, right, in the desert, um, Cindy Sherman's untitled film still. There's definitely a relationship between the work that Cindy Sherman is doing and, and Simmons is doing. Um, so just for a point of comparison with an artist that you may or may not have already heard of, be familiar with. Denver. So a, a lot of speculation. I think she's she's really interested in showing black people in ways that um, are unexpected and that haven't been done before. Yeah, this one, I, I just really love this one with these two houses in Detroit. And then this apartment building over here on the left and this, this little girl, here we get the play of childhood in this all black figure. So we'll have to end with Dawood Bay. Um, you may have seen his retrospective at MoMA um, in San Francisco. Unfortunately, it was up um, during the pandemic. And I think when it opened, uh, it was before the pandemic. And then there was that uh, time period in October where things opened and they shut down again. Um, but this show has been touring um, and um, it's up at the Whitney. So if anyone's going to New York, you can um, see it at the Whitney. Um, I am really going to show, this is a, a, about a six minute video that's really fantastic. And I thought about cutting it into short excerpts and I just don't wanna do it. I, if you're unfamiliar with this work, I really want you to, um, to hear what he has to say. My American project is that piece of the American fabric that is not always engaged or amplified in the great American narrative. Looking at those histories, those subjects who throughout the great American project have very often been marginalized. My work over these past 40 odd years has been about amplifying those presences and amplifying those narratives and those subjects in a visually ambitious way that also engages with the history of photography and how photographs visualize and represent the world. That's my piece of the Great American Project. All photographs start with the imagination. I want to make a certain kind of photograph. And you need to actually do it, you know, to have the uh, assurance that, in fact, you can make a physical thing that's the equal of the idea. I would say that I pretty much learned to make photographs by making those pictures in Harlem from 1975 to 1979, getting to know the community in Harlem, allowing people in the community to get to know me, and trying to make what I felt was an honest representation of African Americans in that particular urban community that in some way stood in relation to the more, I guess you could say, pathologically driven representations of African-Americans. 
What I came to realize in making those photographs, there was not only the picture making part, but there was very clearly the social part. How does one insert themselves momentarily into someone's life and come away with something that resonates with some real aspect of the individual? And the success of that work would be that the camera itself disappeared. You don't look at those portrait-based work and think about the camera. So it moves from being a photograph or a photographic object to being an experience between you and that individual. Over the years, I've never completely lost touch with Harlem. The neighborhood began to be transformed, both socially and spatially. The geography of the community began to transform. I realized that I wanted to make work about how this particular African-American community, where my own personal narrative begins and where my work begins, was being transformed through those forces of global capital and gentrification. That for me was the tension between the past and the present. And I wanted to try to make photographs about those absences and disappearances as it was taking place. For me, one of the things that this exhibition uh, has certainly amplified is the aspect of history. I've always been working either in response to histories, whether it's a personal history or a larger history, or in a way that seeks to insert the black subject or the teenage subject or some other socially marginalized subject into that thing that we call history. History in its retelling tends to become mythic. And that is certainly true in the case of the Underground Railroad because of necessity, those locations, most of them were never known. I had some specific sites that I knew were related and I started looking at the landscape around and in between those sites, trying to look at the contemporary landscape as if it were the landscape of the past and trying to see through the eyes of a fugitive African American escaping from slavery, moving across that landscape under cover of darkness, not in the full bright light of day. I didn't just want to document what remained of that history, but I wanted to find a way through the imagination to make it resonate through the photograph. Okay. I know that took up a lot of our time, but I, I just am so in love with Dawood's photographs. Um, and if we had time, we could talk about Harlem, his life of um, you know 40 years of photographing that place um, and how the photographs changed, how he changed uh, his approach to photographing. Um, but I, I also wanted to, um, in just maybe three minutes that we have, um, look at some of these Underground Railroad photographs with you. These are some of um, the most unforgettable photographs um, that I think I've ever seen. And um, the way in which he explores a spectrum or a range of grays and, um, and blacks is uh, really revealing and has um, a particular mood. So focusing on the uh, past of uh, the Underground Railroad, and he focused um, particularly on a, a city called or a town called Hudson um, in Ohio. And, um, you know, people were moving from the South to the North. Uh, this particular path he was looking at was for um, African-Americans, fugitive slaves, 
who were trying to get to Lake Erie to cross over into Canada. And so um, he's made 25 images in this series. The series is called Night Coming Tenderly, comma, Black. They're from 2017 and they are large format. They're 44 by 55 inches. So this is one and I'm not showing you all of them, of course, Picket Fence and Farmhouse. And he's really trying to capture, uh, again, a mood and a feeling not to do a kind of scientific documentation, but to help us in some way to imagine maybe what that vision would have looked like under the safety of darkness and not thinking about night and darkness as something to be feared, but that that was really the best opportunities for many enslaved people to escape. The, on my screen, these are coming out, um, it appears much lighter than the actual photographs. I think maybe your screen might be adjusting like my screen, but the work is quite dark. Um, the title of the work comes from this poem that I'm delighted to read um, called Dream Variations from 1926 by Langston Hughes that we see here. Um, and it, it captures that, uh, the welcoming of blackness, right? What the end of the day. To fling my arms wide in some place of the sun, to whirl and to dance till the white day is done. Then rest at cool evening beneath a tall tree while night comes on gently dark like me, that's my dream. To fling my arms wide in the face of the sun, dance, whirl, whirl till the day, the quick day is done. Rest at pale evening, a tall slim tree, night coming tenderly black like me. There's a way that I think Hughes in the poetry and then also um, of course, um, David Bay in, in the photographs is, is showing us a kind of shroud of darkness that is, that's something to be welcomed. And that having its own psychological effects on the way that we think about uh, darkness and blackness today. So I'll, um, I'll have to end. Um, I wanted to show you this installation shot of the photographs in this church in Cleveland called St. John's Church. And this actual church, right, not reconstructed, was a uh, important stop on the Underground Railroad, one of the last stops before crossing Lake Erie into Canada. And um, so he's, you know, represented by, um, and I have to give a shout out to Rena Branston, um, his dealer in San Francisco, who was very instrumental in the installation of, of the photographs in this, uh, this church. And um, just to be clear what you're looking at, these are the photographs here that are um, hanging. You can see the cables that come down so that there's this whole network that's been installed along the ceiling. Um, and then the photographs are sort of hanging there, right? Um, moving that they have a kind of um, a presence, right? Um, and you can, or you could at the time go and sit down and sort of be confronted with it, you know, large, larger than your largest computer screen, um, something that envelops you to uh, a kind of different experiential opportunity with photography in this very special environment. Um, and this was installed there in 2018. Um, any thoughts um, about this series, things that you wanna see again or Thoughts about the project or this installation? You can just speak up. I had a question. I was frantically trying to get signed in and I might've missed the first five or so okay. minutes. Um, so um, we, did it start with um, Jacob Lawrence or did, was there anybody before him, any other artists before nope. him? That you talked to? Okay. We, we started with Jacob Lawrence. We had some announcements before that. Okay. 
next time in August, I need to get ready sooner. Okay. <laughs> I knew it was coming, but I thought the link was somewhere more accessible than where it was. That happens to everybody. <laughs> There's that panic. It's going to start. Where's my link? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm looking forward to Romare Bearden. Is he in the third? He can be. You want to, we want to talk about Bearden? Let's do it. Yeah. I, 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 he, I discovered him while um, looking, f creating um, a bibliography of collage artists, information about a lot of different collage artists that was sort of a read more about it for, um, to follow a collage exhibition at the Cantor Art Center. This is several years ago by an, uh, a, a Nazi Holocaust survivor's mm. work, Hannelore Barron. And I found Bearden and I found several other artists. And then after I found Bearden, I found a, a great jazz album by Branford Marcellus. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yes. The Mayor Beard let's, revealed. I love it. <laughs> let's talk about that. Um, let's talk. I'll bring Bearden in and we can talk about the collage on the cover of Branford Marsalis's album. Yeah. We can talk about, yeah, that's a good way to, to think about things because it is about the different papers and fabrics that he puts together yeah. to create something else. Yeah. Um, okay, someone else has their hand up and your name isn't popping up on my screen. So just go ahead. This is Janet, and I just wanted Hi. to say I really appreciated um, hearing the the poetry. That was a really great experience to have the poetry side by side with the um, the photos. I, I very much, you know, appreciate the photos, but it, it really enhanced it to have the yeah. Langston Hughes um, poetry. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And I, you know, I don't, there are a lot of things I, I like to do that I'm not good at. Reading poetry is one, but I get so excited to read the poet because it's so exciting and it, it really does make sense with this work. You can see um, that the way that a bay has interpreted that feeling of joy, you know, and it just adds a whole other dimension. Um, one of the things about museums that doesn't help is sometimes, you know, you'll walk in, you see a photograph and you don't know anything about the history or who made it or, you know, and you just kind of go on to the next thing. But it's so helpful when you can have the poetry, the inspiration, whatever it is, um, some more background information. And then, um, you know, you get a totally different experience. And looking at this slide, right, it's really sacred experience. Um, and you know, totally void of people and how important invisibility was in the Underground Railroad. Um, there's just, yeah, so many sort of nice ways to think about this series and, and the way it was presented. So I'm sure I'm over time. Oh, I'm just a minute over time. Okay, well, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you uh, for being a part of this. And yeah, if you have any requests for artists that you want to talk about for the last um, session, let me know. I guess we're only getting through three artists per, per hour. Um, but so we'll make Bearden one. I'm planning on also talking about Noah Purifoy. Um, and then, yeah, if somebody wants to send a suggestion, I'm happy for us to explore some work together. Thank you, Bridget. This is wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Marsha. Thanks. Yeah, you guys make it wonderful because you're participating. Even people who aren't speaking, um, you're thinking, I think, and you're seeing things maybe for the first time. And that, you know, that's cool. And, you know, congratulations to all of us for figuring out a way to make Zoom work, you know, for us to have some kind of community and engagement um, in this situation. So, um, we are going to have a, a, another event, a closing event um, that uh, we're talking about next month. And so it would be great for people to be there for the um, in person at the Black Index. Be delighted to meet you in person. Yes, we'll be sharing more details about that soon. Um, thank you all for participating. Thank you again, Bridget. This was. Yeah. Amazing. It's my really pleasure. Loved it. and, um, yeah, really appreciated um, all of this. Appreciated all of you for being here and sharing. Thank you all. Thanks. Have a good weekend.